Hello and a warm welcome to federal special program, Capital Beat. Law Commission of India recently issued a notification seeking fresh views on the Uniform Civil Code. And Prime Minister Narendra Modi gave a strong push for Uniform Civil Code at a rally in Bhopal. And this has spawned a new debate once again on the Uniform Civil Code. Is the time ripe for the country to bring in a UCC? And should the personalized laws remain in the statute books after more than 70 years of independence. I'm joined uh, by the veteran Supreme Court lawyer, veteran Congress leader, and former union minister, Salman Khrushchev. So thank you so much uh, for joining on the federal. So my first question to you is that uh, BJP is trying to rush in with the Uniform Civil Code. Is this approach correct? Well, I, uh, they, they, haven't, they haven't given uh, any clear reason as to why uh, there is this urgency, but I can assume any party that has on its manifesto a particular item uh, can not be faulted on, on uh, how quickly or how rapidly they want to get it done. So I, I won't get into that at all. The more interesting question is, do they understand or have they ever understood why a uniform civil code is necessary? They've given some. They've given some reasons. They've said that it's necessary for unity of the country. I find that. I find that a bit far fetched. Uh, I think a lot more is required for unity than a uniform civil code. But uh, they've also said that the Supreme Court has periodically indicated uh, that we are remiss in not having pushed the uniform civil code, and I think. Uh, that needs to be taken seriously if the Supreme Court has thought so and said so. But the Supreme Court has never actually pronounced. It at best has said it as a suggestion, obiter dicta, uh, obviously leaving it open for as and when it is done for the court to actually apply its mind. So I don't think it's fair to be citing the Supreme Court overtly in this matter, but be that as it may, it doesn't matter. Finally, of course, they haven't told us uh, anything at all as to why the Law Commission, but now it becomes apparent the Law Commission, uh, newly founded Law Commission is doing it on behest of the government, that government wants some responses. But why should a new Law Commission uh, not look at what the previous Law Commission had done after a very extensive exercise and, uh, and what urges it to look at it afresh? I think the country should have been told this in the first place. But uh, why are the opposition parties not really asking the government that what is the reason behind pushing it again, given the fact that Law Commission uh, has already said that it's not desirable at the moment? So why well, again this push? The well, I, I, can't speak for, I can't speak for the other parties, but we have said so. We have specifically said so. And we have made it clear that not only, not only is there no reply about why the new law commission should have to revisit this very idea that was so extensively debated, discussed, and pronounced upon by the other law commission, the 21st law commission. But we've also said, we've also said, what is it that you're intending to do? Uh, please tell us what dimensions, aspects, implications there will be for a uniform civil code for purposes of, of uh, people's uh, lives. I mean, how will people's lives be affected? And I think the whole purpose of trying to focus on a particular community, Muslims in this case, is unfair. It's unfair because a unif uniform code would not be for one community alone. It would be for everybody, including the majority, including many sects of the majority, including tribals. So what will be the implications for them and what parts of their law or their customary practices are going to be affected? If this could be indicated, then we could respond and we could come back with a considered considered opinion. Absolutely. Uh, sir, I'll just uh, share with you, there was a BJP leader, I'm not going to name it during the program. He has been sending WhatsApp messages eliciting support on the UCC, saying that, you know, whether you are in favor or whether you are opposed to it. Now, is this... Uh, approach correct, given the fact that we do not have the draft, we do not know how the government is trying to approach this whole issue. 
And now they're eliciting support on WhatsApp. And obviously, if a BJP leader has been sending a WhatsApp to me, it's going to be sent to lakhs and lakhs and crores of people across the country. So what, what would you really say to this kind of an approach? Well, this is, this is quite consistent with the way they deal with democracy. Uh, I... I, I'm not. I mean, I'm. I'm not at all concerned about what that BJP leader or anybody would do. I think that debates should be should be open, like the debate on the federal, uh, any other, any other newspaper channel, etc. But clearly, it must be as you you yourself have flagged. It must be about what are we doing, what are we dealing with now. For instance, let me let me just take this matter further. Uh, they often talk about Shabano, they often talk about triple talaq, etc., saying that, look, the courts had to interfere and, and uh, uh, all this is something that as uniform civil code would obviate, that would remove from, from the law. Now, clearly, uh, both those issues, one can talk about them at length, but this is not the time. Both those issues were about aberrations or misunderstood, misunderstood implications of Islamic precepts and Islamic law. Uh, and therefore, somebody thought that they had to, they needed to intervene. In the case of triple talaq, for instance, there is no such thing as triple talaq. And the court said so. At least some of the judges in the court said so. And if there is no such thing as triple talaq, then you don't need to make a law to do away with triple talaq, and certainly not to criminalize it, etc. Shabano now, for instance, if somebody talks about Shabano, they should also indicate what is the law as it exists today. Forget about the Shabano judgment, but what is the law as it exists today? Also endorsed by the Supreme Court, five judges of the Supreme Court. What is the law? The law is clear. The law is clear that you have certain rights in Islam. If your rights in Islam are not given to you, then of course for you to fall back on the general law is justified. And nobody is going to object to that. Absolutely nobody is going to object to that. It's just the manner in which distortion of Islamic law is done. So it's almost like you put up a puppet and then you go boxing with that puppet and say, look, I've knocked out that puppet. That's not what should happen. Let's talk about, let's talk about what the law really is, how unadulterated law is still unacceptable, and what reform is possible in every personal law and if reform is possible, then we should push for reform rather than doing away with personal law in wholesale. Absolutely. But sir, rather than an informed, uh, you know, uh, uh, deliberation on this, uh, government seems to be driven by certain impulses, which uh, the political analysts are talking about. Like, for example, they say that UCC will almost become a blueprint, you know, for the, for the dominant groups, uh, you know, thinking that it is going to subsume all other laws. Now, is that not going to lead uh, to some kind of an insecurity as far as other minority groups are concerned? Say, for example, in Muslims, in Sikhs or Parsis or Jews, or even for that matter, for the tribals? Well, that's it. I mean, I, the point is that we have this country will have to make a choice. Um, apart from whatever the, whatever the, the emotional strands may be connected with the Uniform Civil Code and personal law, we have to make a choice. Do we genuinely believe in diversity and what are what are the dimensions of diversity or do we actually believe in uniformity not unity everybody subscribes to unity uniformity is different from unity so do we subscribe to uniformity or do we subscribe to diversity our understanding cultural political constitutional has always been that india celebrates diversity the only thing is what is the extent of this diversity that you can, you can uh, accept or you can celebrate? There may be arguments about that, and we may be able to work on negotiated contours of diversity. I mean, there are certain things that you may not like, you still have to accept because that's the part of liberal democracy. On the other hand, for those who want uniformity, they must come clean and they say what uniformity means. Today, Today, you are asking for, in the name of equality, dignity of human beings, etc., you are asking for uniformity as far as personal laws are concerned. Tomorrow, will you ask for uniformity as 
as far as core religions are concerned will you will you seek uniformity as far as cultures and subcultures are concerned would you seek uniformity as far as language is concerned and identity would you would you obliterate identity these are big questions that have to be answered before we tackle one particular dimension which is personal law but uh, do you believe uh, looking at the track record how consultations and deliberations have happened in the bjp government are you are you convinced that bjp is really going to get into an honest deliberation and uh, a consultative uh, mechanism given the fact that we've seen how uh, demonetization was brought in how gst was brought in uh, people are still talking about the fact that look uh, uh, ram mandir has been brought in by bjp they've brought in uh, uh, article 370 and on the similar lines ucc is also going to be uh, brought in uh, what are the fears really well they i mean they, i'm sure that there are a lot of people who feel apprehensive i i i believe that this is uh, not a not a time for panic or for uh, people to uh, uh, people to to get provoked into anything i think this is a time for for sensible sound uh, and thoughtful response to whatever is happening let me just tell you uh, whatever the bjp may have done with demonetization in the first round when they do it in the second round it is painless has anyone felt any problem as far as the 2000 rupee note being demonetized is concerned they've given enough time they will achieve the same purpose as they achieved the first time more or less etc why they could not have done the same thing earlier i can't understand and i wish the courts would ask them that you've done it the second time perfectly well why could you couldn't have done it the first time you're not questioning your right to demonetize you're not questioning your right but that you didn't have to do it at the stroke of a midnight hour it could have been done at that time also the way you've done it now so similarly i think in whatever else they are doing they will understand subsequently that what they have done requires a second look and they would possibly then in future behave differently and i think that would be done that would be done if the elections in 2024 go the, go the right way now if they want to make this an issue in elections that's tough that is tough because because they don't give any information about this if people who are not happy with it start reacting uh, by sheer provocation and then give up give up a thoughtful way of responding then we really would be doing great injustice to ourselves so i think the 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 call for the time is to tell people how there is no substance in what they are saying the manner in which various groups and individuals have gone to the 21st law commission and explained why this is not necessary and there were a lot of muslim women who did it very well well educated well informed muslim women who did it as well there are women on both sides there are some people who want uh, interference but even those who want interference are talking about reform they're not talking about a ucc and i think there'll be a larger consensus in this country including amongst minorities on reform but uh, do you think that the political parties really can take blunt positions on ucc in such a polarized uh, political environment because look at the fact that aam aadmi party has uh, without even seeing into it Uh, to what the draft has been they have said that they are in support of ucc but yes with a general caveat that there should be a consultative mechanism uh, yeah i think, any... I think they, they, there's a very clever formulation i i don't want to run them down but there's a very clever formulation that is not very different from those of the other parties that are saying why should we respond unless we know what you intend to do and in any case you're doing it in a hurry etc so i think the wording they have may have been slightly different and it's been projected at a at that particular time as uh, as as a green signal given to the bjp but uh, i don't think there is much comfort there at all if you if you read their their statements carefully then i don't think there is much comfort to the bjp and i i can't believe that the aam aam aadmi party can afford being particularly being in government in punjab and also relying heavily on muslim votes here in delhi i don't think aam aadmi party can can take any other position uh, from the other other political parties but mr kurshid you agree to the fact that many people say that political parties and you know the muslim uh, intellectuals have somehow impeded the path of ucc because of vote banks and because of various other uh, vested interests is that the fact uh, and yes. uh, 
it cuts yes. both ways, doesn't it? That that cuts both ways. I mean, it's being brought for for political interests. It was impeded because of political interests. So why don't we get rid of both political interests and then seriously sit down and talk about reform? I believe I believe a lot of reform that has already happened in the rest of the Islamic world is entirely possible here. There are elements in Islamic theology that permit for reform. And uh, I, I believe it gives a great deal of leeway to people as long as you're doing it honestly. So I think there's no, there's no issue about reform. I think reform can be there. Of course, people who are ultra conservative, who, are, who, who have a line drawn in stone and will not, will not want to do anything at all. But there are reasons why that can be explained, why they are of that nature. But there will be a much larger number of people who will support a consensus on reform. But Mr. Kushit, uh, do you believe that the political compulsions can really dictate the discourse on such a seminal issue? On everything, on China, political con political political uh, reasons prevent the kind of discussion that we should have had on China. Uh, I mean, there are uh, whenever some strategic some strategic uh, uh, issue or sovereignty issue comes in, then a lot of people become careful about about saying or not saying because they're immediately accused of being anti-national and so on. So this problem remains across the board in our democracy. But I just hope there'll be enough people brave enough to take uh, whatever whatever they have to from the government, as indeed from from people who are not associated with the government. Uh, so you don't fall between two stools, but we have the courage to say that look. I will speak the truth, uh, even if it ang angers people on both sides. Right. But Mr. Kushit, you, you do suspect the fact that BJP is trying to uh, rush in with UCC with an aim to polarize the voters just before 2024. Is that yeah. the if, reason for that? If they haven't learned if they haven't learned a lesson from Karnataka, then they'll get that lesson again. Let them try and polarize. After all, this is only about, about the law that manages our life. Uh, Karnataka, they had brought God into the election. And they lost that election. So what, what is left after you've brought God into an election? What is left of, uh, of your attempts to polarize? So if they haven't learned the lesson yet, they will learn it again. But you, you still feel that if enough deliberation or consultation doesn't happen, it's really going to challenge uh, the cultural autonomy of the country? I certainly think. I, I certainly think. I think it's, uh, uh, it's essentially, essentially, uh, undermining the the very idea of diversity, cult cultural diversity. Uh, uniformity of culture, uniformity of uh, of religion, uniformity of language, you know, uniformity of our way of life is not the answer for unity. The answer for unity is unity in diversity, and I think this is a fundamental mistake that the BJP is making. But does the government look confused when it comes to uniformity and diversity? Are they confused somewhere? Oh, no, they are not confused. They're very clear. They're very clear. They're only comfortable with uniformity. They don't like diversity at all. They don't even like diversity amongst themselves. They don't even like diversity amongst, amongst committed, committed followers of the government. They have a great problem with diversity. Um, I would imagine that one of them would wake up one day and say, why don't we remove this word diversity from the, from the lexicon? If we do, at least we'll be a better country. I'm sure that one of these days you'll hear this coming as well. One last question, Mr. Krishi, that there's been a landmark uh, verdict in the United States of America on uh, the affirmative action. People have already started uh, writing on the social media that it could have an impact in India about the discourse on reservations. Uh, what is your uh, view on this? Is it really going to have an impact given the fact that BJP has already burnt its fingers, if you remember, in 2015 <laughs> during the uh, the Bihar elections, Mohan Bhagwat said that the reservation policy should be reviewed. And then they really had to eat the humble pie. So do you think that the debate is going to be reignited again because of the America's uh, verdict? If I, want, if I wanted to be mischievous, I would have said, look, this happened days after Mr. Modi visited the United States of America. But 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 that then then I would I'd be doing things that the way they do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I. I think there's a vast difference in the American constitutional structure and the Indian constitutional structure. I think the Indian constitution provides a far sounder basis for reservations. I, we have, may have differences on some dimensions and aspects of how reservations are implemented, but I think we have in the Indian constitution a sounder basis for, 
reverse discrimination or affirmative action. Uh, but, you know, there are elements in the American constitutional uh, jurisprudence that have been reflected in India as well. How long will this continue is a question that Indian judges have been asking as well. American judges ask that very squarely in, in this, this particular, particular judgment they've just given. But I think that uh, having said that, I cannot but empathize with President uh, Barack Obama when he says, this has broken my heart. Uh, now, when, when a president like Obama can say something of that nature, it just suggests what, what is the, the extent to which we need to debate and, and talk about issues uh, and not just take them lying down or get provoked into some, some, you know, some unacceptable action. So it's, a, it's to reiterate the same is necessary here, just as they've talked about it there. And then remember that, that Bakke held the ground for such a long time affirmative action held the ground for such a long time. Right. And on the same reasoning, on the same reasoning, the majority in the American Supreme Court today has reversed it. So there's always a hope ultimately in what judges can do. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Krishit. It was really a pleasure having you on the program. And one appeal to the viewers who are watching this interview, subscribe to our channel, send us your feedback and stay tuned to The Federal. Subscribe to The Federal's YouTube page for more news and updates.